So apparently there was a debate this week. Uh, I, I, maybe the candidate will, both candidates will can still be running for office here in another week. I guess we'll have to find out. But either way, I'm excited to be joined this week by Dexter Tarbox, contributor here at the New England Take. How are you? Hi, AJ. I'm doing well. How about you? I'm well. He's representing the Trump side of the debate. And on the other side of it, we have our friend Matt Robeson of the Beyond Politics podcast. Yeah, welcome back. You were just here a couple of weeks ago. Oh, it's great to be back. Sorry, I had a mouthful of dog there, so um, <laughs> I, I just, yeah, oh, I'm swallowed. I'm all good now. Oh, okay, we're all good. No, no choking on, on air. You can choke afterwards when I, when I don't need to deal with editing. All right, so here's the deal. We're going to do a debate of the debate, essentially, is my goal here. So there... But I don't think either candidate did necessarily as, as good as everyone hoped overall. Um, I think we can all probably agree on that. But let, just just to start off with, I want each of you, starting with Matt, and then we'll go to Dexter, make like the, the 60 second case that you think your respective candidate did at least fairly well and is not going to drop out of the race in the next, I don't know, three days or something. Yeah, look, from a Democrat's perspective, it's obviously wonderful to not have a candidate that's going to drop out of the race in the next three weeks, let's say, coming out of a presidential debate. Kamala Harris didn't have to do a darn thing because Donald Trump was doing all the doing for her by descending into, I don't know, unrelenting drivel. It was it was insane. And honestly, um, you know, I wrote this up in Newsweek as a, it, for my Republican friends, o among which I'm fortunate to count many. I'm surprised that they didn't kind of explode in in shame and anger. I mean, genuine anger, like for the old school Republicans out there. What the heck is happening to my party? I would be thinking, why is this escaped mental asylum lunatic leading the Republican Party? This is not the grand old party anymore. And it, it's it, it, it's sad to, to quote to quote the great Don himself. It's sad. Um, it's it's depressing, I think, for a legacy that counts Ronald Reagan and Dwight Eisenhower and, you know, other reasonably good political leaders, it's sad. Now, Dexter, I wouldn't exactly call you the old Republican Party in any sense no. of the phrase. <laughs> so you're you're definitely more of a new right MAGA guy, generally speaking, I, I, I'd say. So uh, make the case why you think your, the Trump side did, did, oh, did well during the debate. Well, well let me tell you, you know, uh, I'll admit that I'm surprised at the extent to which media pundits now have piled onto Trump, um, including yourself, AJ, uh, in what I would consider to be, at worst, a draw. Um, so, of course, yeah, while we all acknowledge that Trump missed some opportunities to put Harris on the defensive, to call her out, he didn't get lost in ad hominem attacks or digressions, as many of us were, were worried about. Um, well, Harris herself, she didn't face plant. She didn't indulge in the, the word salads that we're used to. Um, I do think she revealed herself to be what we've always known her to be, um, which is a snake. Uh, she zigs to the right on immigration in contrast to her own objectively true statements. I mean, she did, in fact, once actively support gender transition surgeries for detained migrants. Uh, then she brags about her endorsements from Dick Cheney and other members of the Bush administration and this Republican old guard who the left has long decried as war criminals. So clearly she's willing to move in any direction she can. And then, of course, when you confront her with direct questions, um, um, for example, on why the Biden-Harris administration has kept the Trump tariffs in place. Um, she refuses to even attempt at answering that question. She refuses an attempt to explain why most voters feel that they were better off under the Trump administration than they are now economically. Um, um, in all points, she, she offered a load of nothing. And while she carried herself well, um, I... I I'm hesitant to call that a victory on her part, simply for exceeding the already low expectations she was met with. So I'm going to stick with you for this, Dexter, to start off with. So the bit, one of the big reasons why I changed my mind on exactly how well Trump during the, did during the debate is it didn't click with me till afterwards. Like he literally took the bait every single time something was brought up, and instead of being able to say, "Harris, hey," You're screw up. You're, you've done terrible for th almost four years now in office. Because guess what? You're one of the, part of the incumbent presidency. He was just chasing his own tail the entire time. Would you say that's a fair argument? 
I don't know if he was chasing his tail the entire time. I think he hit her well on policy points on a number of important occasions. But I have to say, all this talk about baiting, uh, and I put it in quotes, um, seems to ignore what I mean, conceal um, the central fact that Harris is the one who dodged policy questions by making it personal. You know, yes, he may have taken the bait on crowd size or on his inheritance, but it was Harris who raised those issues to avoid taking on her otherwise indefensible positions and record. Um, and so I'm just confused as by what kind of double standard does her repeatedly going low and being petty make Trump the villain? Can I, can I do something counterintuitive here and kind of agree with Dexter? Um, boy, this is going to just kill your whole debate vibe, AJ. I'm sorry. I apologize to you. I apologize to the viewers and the listeners. But uh, Dexter... I actually think you're right. I think that if we were objectively, you know, over a beer, which I think the three of us would enjoy together, if we were trying to grade the debate performance, we would probably say, yeah, Kamala Harris was a far better debater. She jabbed, she pivoted, she baited him, she got him off message. What are we doing here? Like, why do we care as voters that she has more skill at this abstruse, like performance art that we do in America of presidential debates. I don't care. This does nothing for my kids. Um, this does nothing for my understanding as a voter of what her plans would be for the future. Um, I don't think we should be evaluating her or the debate or either of them as candidates on their debate performance. Where I think Dexter will stop nodding, unfortunately, um, and I'm sorry for this, man, uh, is that I think that the jabs that she threw were very real and they were very full of proof and they were very legitimate. I think it is legitimate for voters to consider the fact that Donald Trump is an adjudicated rapist. That's that's the judge in the case saying this is the proper term. This is his words to use about Donald Trump. Donald Trump is a rapist. Donald Trump is a convicted felon. Donald Trump is an increasingly incoherent serial liar and an insurrectionist. And if you don't like all of that, which I imagine a lot of people don't, just stick to policy. Just look at his 20% tariff plan, which I had Mitt Romney's budget director on my show to talk about. And we ran through from a conservative economist perspective. He works for the Manhattan Institute. It, it doesn't get much more right wing than that. And he thinks that this is an absolute economic atom bomb that would be dropped on the middle class. This is an incoherent and destructive economic plan that he has as the centerpiece of his whole plan for the future. That is the basis on which we should be judging the candidate. So I'll just circle back and I'll, I'll, I'll say that I would have loved as kind of a detail oriented wonky guy to hear more about policies and plans from both candidates. I would have appreciated that, but I don't discount what Kamala Harris brought forward. And I think the voters of this country should be judging on the fact that you have someone who is incoherent, mentally unbalanced, unable to put together a, a, a functioning word sentence um, that connects to, its, to itself. We just drummed the current president off of the ticket for that exact same problem. The same thing should apply to Donald Trump, and that is a legitimate basis. Forget the debate, forget the performance art. That is a legitimate basis on which to judge these candidates. Go ahead, Dexter, before we uh, dive into maybe some more debate. Yeah, that was a lot. Discussion that was a lot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, no, no, I, I think that's the, we can get into the policy discussion, but I think just taking it briefly back to the idea of the debate of this sort of performance art that we we did all nationally engage. I think there were 68 million people watching, it turned out. Um, I mean, in, in your own piece yesterday for Newsweek, um, you, you referenced a quote that said Trump's debate performance against Clinton left the Trump campaign in ruins. I mean, evidently not. Uh, he <laughs> succeeded. And Harris actually did implode after her debate performance when she sought the presidency in 2020. And while Trump managed also to effectively oust Biden from his own campaign after the first debate. So I don't think that we can go around and say that debates mean nothing um, when we have at least these three good examples. Oh, I I agree with you. It's not that they mean nothing. It's that they're a bad proxy for what I think people like us would like to judge 
our political leaders on. You know, I mean, I, I've been a congressional staffer. You know, we're all, we're all people who have been in and around government before, and I just love to see a scenario where, like, for example, why why don't they get to bring notes into these things? I mean, when does the president? make a decision without notes, without aides, without, you know, conversation and debate. I'd like to see the, the candidate for the presidency engage in that on stage live. And like, let me see how she or he takes it. Anyway, I'm going down a tangent. I, I just I just hate the artifice of what we just went through. And I think it's a bad proxy. It, it, it measures something. I agree with you. It measures something. It, it seems like the... The debate basically reinforced the fact that this these campaigns are running off of, and this is the meme at this point, especially with Harris, it's, it's a vibes campaign. It has nothing to do with policy. It is uh, everything to do with, oh, sh I'm going to feel better voting for Harris as opposed to Biden that could barely function, and Trump who is Trump with the track record and baggage that comes along with that. On, on can the can I push back yeah. gently yeah, on yeah, that, yeah, though? Please. I will say... Um, I will I will grant Dexter's point that there are criticisms that can be made. And I put this in the in the Newsweek article as well. There are legitimate criticisms that can be made of Kamala Harris's record, previous positions, previous statements, and policy plans. However, between the two of them, it did seem to me, I'm I'm curious if you saw the same thing. It seemed to me that she was putting forward more substantive policy plans. She was not addressing previous issues, for example, quasi, you know, uh, 2019. But she was putting together fairly detailed proposals on tax policy, economic policy, a pretty firm position on fracking, whether or not you, you believe it jives with her previous positions. I didn't hear a single forward-looking policy plan from Trump other than he said mass deportations, which he said would be bloody, and uh, further tariffs on China. I mean, I did I miss something? I mean, it it just it seemed to me that there was more policy detail coming from Harris. I'm wondering what the bloody reference is into. Uh, you're not talking about yeah. the economic bloodbath, talking about the auto industry, which is an oft misquoted line, um, which which Harris misquoted without a fact check um, the other evening. I think Muir, didn't Muir bring it up and say, you said bloody, and he's like, yeah, I, maybe I missed it. Maybe I missed it in the transcript. I, I was taking notes very furiously and probably wrong <laughs> at that point. But I, I don't think that he was fact-checked on the bloody line. And I, mm. he, I, I recall that he corrected Harris um, by, by giving the full line that he was discussing a bloodbath in the auto industry. Oh, maybe. Yeah, maybe. Um, yeah, yeah, I don't think he was referring to his... Um, mass deportation plans um as being a potentially bloody uh exercise but it, it just it seemed to me i, I was just responding to to aj yeah, and i'm just noting that yeah, yeah. not noting yeah 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 point. i yeah. mean yeah. i think th look there's a heavy dose of vibes uh there's a heavy dose of vibes coming from the harris campaign no doubt about it i just I, I thought that that she was relatively substantive i mean if anything as a kind of um as I was sipping my, what, what am I supposed to do as a liberal? As, as I was sipping my Merlot and, and munching on arugula. <laughs> you're, you're, white, you're a chilled white wine. You're yes, that's dead. right. Um, I was, uh, you know, I was, I put my feet up on my Tesla and I was watching the first answer and I'm like, dude, why are you listing all your policy plans? Thank you, Hillary. Like, I wasn't, I wasn't that into that. It, it's... So I, I think this is going to come down to more of a long-term issue with whether or not there's going to be a second debate a little bit when it comes to the policy situation. Because to me, it seemed like Kamala was really was able to do a really good job of staying on script. She's great at staying on script. When she when she has notes and she knows what she's getting into, it's that lawyer background. She's She's a pro at that. There's no way around it. I don't think you can hold that up for multiple debates. I think eventually she's going to hit a wall and she's going to have to answer Trump. Trump can keep his act together, I think, for at least one debate. If they can have multiple, I mean, they'd be great. I think he can at least get it figured out for one debate where he can stay on task and stay on the attack of Kamala and make sure that she's going to have to address actual issues more in depth. I don't think she will have that ability. Uh, I don't know who wants to jump into that theory. No, but let me I've say that I don't so think she addressed. Yeah. 
No, go, and I'll be brief even, but let me just say that my initial reaction to it was more that Trump won on policy and Kamala Harris won on delivery. Um, because especially when we look at um, the record we have of policy proposals from Kamala Harris, it's extremely scarce. Um, she she just recently posted something on her website, much of which it seems was taken from the Biden website. Um, prior to that, she had given all but one scripted interview with her vice presidential candidate. Uh, and otherwise, we really didn't have a lot of positive um, policy assertions from her. So I'm not surprised that people on the left are happy with what they got because it was better than the nothing they had before. Um, but, but I certainly don't think she offered very many fulsome policy proposals for the economy or for the border. So I say she pivoted right uh, on, on general topics about the border. Um, I, I don't think she articulated, um, and again, these are some of the highest ranking issues uh, in terms of what voters are concerned about. But on economy on the border, I didn't hear enough from her that would justify the silence we've had since her, her anointing. I... What I took away was $6,000 child tax credit to help affordability, a lot of focus on housing policy, housing affordability, um, maybe too much uh, from my from my taste as a communications uh, background, you know, professional, um, you know, a little bit too much in the weeds there, $50,000 um, uh, tax credit for business, small business startups. Um, you know, pretty firm position on fracking, which is consistent with the position she's had um during the biden administration now look i'll i'll go with you on i would have loved her to fill in a little bit of a gap for me right if the last thing i remembered about her was her being against fracking in 2019 and now she's pro okay just fill in the gap and it is cool it is fine to say you know what i was the vice president of the united states i was governing and i saw we need to do this. And by the way, and she did say this in the debate, by the way, we've accomplished the greatest expansion in history of American gas and oil production. And we are now number one in the world. And it is in part because of our all of the above type policy. By the way, solar and renewables, all that's grown too. We are an energy powerhouse. And that's what I want to keep going and fracking as part of that. Fine. Say that. Say that you've got a growth mindset and you know, you, you've gone with that. I, I can nitpick that. But in general, yeah. You know, but I what's think the explanation policy, yeah. for the conversion, the fundamental conversion she had over her convictions about its impact on the environment? I mean, she's done nothing to explain overcoming that. I, I, right. And I have to interpolate. I agree with you. I agree with you. And I, I have to interpolate. So I have to say, like, well, here's what she could say. Um, and I wish she had said is, yeah, I grew, I learned, I was in office and, you know, I've evolved on this because I've seen the impact in Pennsylvania of the jobs it creates. I've seen the geopolitical impact and talk about, you know, how strong a supporter of the state of Israel I am. We need to wean ourselves off of foreign oil so that we can reduce the power threshold of, of states like Iran and, you know, win back, you know, our geopolitical position. Any of those things would have been fine. That would have been fine. But, you know, look, would have been great. Would have been great. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like I, maybe I'll run someday. But, you know, look, to AJ's point, I don't know. I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if it will be a problem if there is a second debate for her to um, stay as relentlessly on message. If I were a betting man and I had to bet on Harris or Trump to stay more disciplined on message, I'm going to go with Harris. I don't know about you guys. Um, and the final thing I'll say is at the end of the day, I don't ding her for being disciplined and sticking to talking points and staying on message because again, that has no correlation whatsoever with doing the job of president, right? Like, you know, behind the scenes in the Oval Office, meeting with advisors, taking information, understanding the information, not drawing on a hurricane map with a Sharpie because it fits your preconceived notions about where politically you'd like to say a hurricane is going to hit, not suggesting that you blow up said hurricane with a nuclear weapon. Um, that's what I would like to judge future presidents on. But what about the importance of communicating to the people, especially prior to election when we're judging her? And I'll give you even that that once in office, I don't think it's as necessary to be a, a, as constant a talker as maybe Trump was when he held office. Uh, um, but certainly Republicans when, when indeed wish that he had done less of it. 
<laughs> many do. <laughs> but, but certainly when, when there's a pending election, there's got to be an obligation on her to communicate her policy positions again, more than she would when in office, perhaps. And, and that seems to be what's lacking. I think that's what people hope for in the debate. I think they're happy because they got a little of that. But I still question if, if, if it's much, much too little um, to really be able to understand her. I, 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 for my preference, for my personal preference, sure. Like I'm, I would sit back and read an Elizabeth Warren policy paper all night long. Cause I'm into that kind of thing. I don't think that's what the majority of voters. Yeah. I'm a weirdo, right? Like I don't think the majority of voters, especially undecided voters, which we happen to know based on, you know, research and polling are super turned out, super turned off. And if they haven't gotten the fundamentals to inform their choice at this point, I seriously doubt that they, what they really want is to dive into the intricacies of future tax policy all that much more. Um, you know, look, and I will say on the other well, side, if they're of the net equation, taxpayers, they might, I mean, yeah, I, I don't think most people do that. And again, I think Kamala has been pretty clear about where she wants to go on taxes. If anything, like that's the area she's filled in the most. On the other side of the coin, you have this very weird situation where for months, nay, for a full year, the entire Trump team was cosseted in the basement of the Heritage Foundation crafting Project 2025. The very top policy officials from the first Trump administration are sitting there clacking away till they reach 900 pages of policy plans that are completely off the wall. Now, Donald Trump has disavowed that. OK, fine. That is not your policy plan. Let's say we stipulate that for a second. What is your plan, sir, as you like to be called? Um, I, I, it can't just be a case of MAGA bingo, right? It's like, I'm against transgender surgery for illegal immigrants in jail. Um, I, by the way, I love that moment. I nearly called out bingo. Um, it was just missing, um, Gina, Wall, and Gobbledygook. So, I mean, I, other than that, I'm not sure what he's planning to do except for prosecute all his enemies, which is one of the things he, he's promised to do. Um, terminate the Constitution, which I don't know. AJ, you're a libertarian. I think you like the Constitution. I like the Constitution. Um, I, I, I'm not sure I'm getting a lot more policy detail. All right, Dex, sir, I'm going to let, let you respond, then we got to wrap. <laughs> Sorry, I said no, no, I, I, no, no, it was I'm a great rant. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah, it was good. It was good. You know, I, I was, uh, yeah, I was very taken by it. Uh, <laughs> l let me say that in the case of Trump, uh, as opposed to Kamala Harris, um, we actually have a record of what he does in terms of policy because he was the president for four years which, according to the polls, many people still um, consider very highly. Uh, many of the policies that he enacted, be it economic policies, border policies, his judicial appointments, and so on. You mentioned um, whether or not this would move by better informing independent voters. Well, we do actually have some numbers coming out of this last debate on that. And in fact, it moved them, if anything, slightly in favor of Trump. Um, so it would almost seem that they were more educated on Trump's policy positions, even though we have four years to look back on, as as they were to hum, uh, Kamala, who who did not seem to me to articulate much in the ter uh, in the way of substance. Um, so I don't know. I, I don't feel that I'm left baffled as to what Trump would do in office. I think it's 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 rather clear. Okay. So to wrap up here, I want sixty seconds each from you. Does the we just talked about it for half an hour, but does any of it matter? Does this debate matter at all to anybody, or is this going to be lost to the news cycle like everything else? Uh, start with uh, you, Dexter. Uh, you know what? I don't think it shifts the numbers at all. Uh, again, we've seen some movement in terms of independence. Some of that's also not from scientific polling, but from focus groups. So who knows what it's worth? Frankly, who knows what any polling is worth uh, at this time in the, the political universe? So no, I, I don't think that this debate will shift it much. Uh, a second one might do more. Uh, we've seen Trump change quite a bit between debates in the past, um, where he's changed strategies and had a more successful result the second go. Um, that's very well possible. On the other hand, I don't necessarily know that if he, if he needs to do it. Uh, I, again, I think that his policies and his positions are pretty clear and well articulated through multiple media interactions, rallies, events, debates, and his previous term. Um, it would benefit Kamala Harris more to have more opportunity to articulate her positions to as large an audience as we reached the other night. Um, and if she can do it, I think it would be to her benefit. 
Um, but I don't know if she can do it, and I don't know if it's going to happen. I can't disagree with anything you said, Dexter. I, I, I think you're spot on. I really do. Uh, the evidence suggests that by and large debates do not affect i'm going to quote from an actual science study here um they do not affect vote formation at all boy there's a hoity-toity academic phrase if i've ever heard one um they they just don't um there are of course historical examples of you know like we just saw one a couple months ago where something really major seems to happen i think that's the exception that proves the rule so no i i don't expect that this debate will affect things a lot. But I, I also agree with your point that it's awfully hard to know because this is a really hard cycle to, to understand how we're polling, um, who we're talking to. We're talking about razor thin margins, tens of thousands of voters in a handful of swing states. We don't know who they are. We don't know what they're responding to. It may be that the most significant thing that happened uh, on Tuesday night was Taylor Swift uh, trolling JD Vance and endorsing Kamala Harris. That might have been that might have been the biggest event of the night. And the final thing I'll say is, I think that's a shame. I think for the kinds of people who watch the New England take, that's a shame because your people who are smart and engaged and care about all this, you care about the country, you're willing to listen to me and Dexter kind of and our different points of view because you're interested and you want to think about these things. And I think a format like the debate that doesn't move the vote, that doesn't have consequences, is a darn shame, and it does a disservice to voters in a democracy. Matt Robeson, That's Beyond Politics. That's a well-taken point as well, yeah. Yeah, Matt Robeson, Beyond Politics, thanks so much for joining today. My pleasure. And I'll put links in the episode description to the Beyond Politics podcast and the Newsweek article that uh, Matt published a couple days ago. And Dexter Tarbox, contributor here at the uh, show. Welcome back. Thank you for uh, coming back. Thanks a lot. It was a lot of fun. All right, I'll link uh, Dexter's X account in the link below. I'll uh, put, if I remember, I'll put it in the episode description. If I don't know why you care, but I'll put my my opinion pieces I did with, with WKX on WDEV. Uh, I was on those two stations this week talking about the debate with Ross Connolly and Ken Kale. So uh, I don't know, some different opinions. Maybe go check that out. All right, NewEnglandTake.com. Like and subscribe. Talk to you soon.